I'm Mark Jordan, and I'm reading chapter 12, the final chapter of Israel, the Church, and the Kingdom of God, written by Maurice Barrett. The chapter title is Out of Babylon. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you are not partakers of her sins, and that you don't receive her plagues. Jude chapter 1, 23 says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. God now began to call the remnant out of Babylon, and it all started with intercession. Here is another principle that is applicable today, and we need to understand it. Intercession is a large subject on its own, and I only want to mention it here as being the prerequisite for deliverance from the system. Daniel's prayer, after he had received the revelation that the 70 years were fulfilled, was instrumental in the return of some of the exiles to the land of Israel and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. Daniel had been in captivity the whole of the 70 years, and I'm sure he must have read the prophecy of Jeremiah many times. Only when the time came, according to God's divine plan, did Daniel receive the revelation that 70 years had been fulfilled. This provoked his wonderful model prayer of intercession. We would do well to study not only the prayer, but also the fasting and sackcloth that accompanied it in the light of our present world and church situation. Daniel chapter 9, 1 to 2 says, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Timing is everything. We cannot receive revelation from God even when it is written in God's word until the predetermined time. Much of Daniel's prophecy had to be sealed until the end times, which I believe is this present age. Daniel chapter 12 verse 9 says, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Another condition also had to be in place before the remnant could leave Babylon, and that was for the present king of Babylon to issue a decree that would allow them to return, not only with their wives and children, but with the gold and silver Nebuchadnezzar had taken into Babylon. It is, it is good to know that all the gold of the tabernacle and temple originally came from Egypt when Israel spoiled them. Cyrus, a despot, was used by God to decree that all of this would happen. From this point in the study, I am calling any ruler from this statue of Babylon, that is, the Median, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires, the king of the system. So although Cyrus was a Persian king, he was spiritually the present king of Babylon. This will continue throughout history until we have a final antichrist, king of our present Babylon system. Whoever rules this system is antichrist, ruler of the counterfeit church. Only the remnant that come out of Babylon are the true church that Abraham started when he came out of Babylon. Any one of God's children who are still in Babylon are in the counterfeit church and will be judged with her. No wonder in the book of Revelation it says, in chapter 18 verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you are not partakers of her sins, and that you don't receive of her plagues. Volunteers only, please. When Ezra took a remnant back to the land of Israel, it was for those who volunteered. There was not a conscription, but many did give up their lifestyle in Babylon to make a fresh start in their desolate homeland. The edict of Cyrus and the request of Nehemiah and Ezra was not just to repatriate the Jews. It was also for the purpose of rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. This is important because the principle never changes. And this was the first time the prophecies would be fulfilled. The prophecies of the return of the exiles and the building of the temple would happen again many times until a final spiritual building of the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, is completed. 
This is the call of our present age, and we will look at it in more detail in later volumes of this study. We in this present age must leave Babylon in order to build the city, which is the bride of Christ. And it is no use at all leaving Babylon if it is not to rebuild that Jerusalem. Egypt to Canaan, Babylon to Jerusalem. There is no point leaving Egypt if you are not on your way to the promised land. You will live in a desert. This is the, face, this is the fate rather, of most of God's people. They, live, they leave Egypt, that is, they are redeemed from the world, they're saved, but they never reach the promised land and so die in the wilderness. Only two people, Joshua and Caleb, out of three million entered the promised land, a very small remnant. By the same rule, it is no use leaving Babylon if you are not on your journey to rebuild Jerusalem the bride. It is no use leaving the church system unless you become the church, the children of Abraham, and you are seeking a city whose builder and maker is God, the new Jerusalem. Discipleship is always a voluntary decision, not a conscription, for the price is very high. Salvation is free, but holiness is not. And that is why so many Christians today will not pay the price to leave Babylon. The kings meet, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, deceive them and they become unfruitful. Why should they sacrifice when they can eat the king's meat, drink his wine and live like kings? The Apostle Paul reprimanded the Corinthian church for this lifestyle and he asked them to follow his example of frugality and simplicity and humility. 1 Corinthians 4, 8 to 16, he says, Now you are full. Now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God that you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. Physical, but not spiritual. A remnant of God's people returned to the land that God had promised them to rebuild the physical walls of Jerusalem and plant vineyards and olive groves. But it is a very sad fact that they never left Babylon in their hearts. God took his people out of Egypt, but he could not take Egypt out of his people. God sent a remnant out of Babylon, but he has never to this day removed Babylon from his people. Only a remnant in each generation has have achieved this. And they are the ones who have changed nations and had a lasting effect on history for the good. Israel remained a backslidden nation for the next few hundred years and at the time that God's son was born was still playing the whore. They were controlled by the Pharisees who were teaching not the law of Moses but the doctrines of Babylon, the tradition of the elders. And Jesus challenged the Pharisees for this error. Matthew chapter 15 and 1 to 3 says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Only by revelation. Only a small remnant recognized God's Son, and much of that was by divine revelation. Even Peter had to have a divine word that Jesus was the Son of God. Matthew chapter 16, 16 to 17. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father in heaven. Peter already knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the political leader, a prophet who would restore Israel. See John chapter 1 verse 40. All the disciples of Jesus thought that the restoration of Israel, as foretold by their own prophets, would happen in their lifetime and that Jesus would deliver them from the iron fist of Rome. What they did not know was that Jesus was God's son. That is, God manifest in the flesh. And when it was revealed to Peter, 
Then Jesus immediately forbade them to tell anyone this fact. It was only to be understood by divine revelation. This hasn't changed. And for a man or woman to receive teaching about Jesus without this revelation is not only ineffective, but dangerous to the real life of Christ. Matthew chapter 16, 17 to 20 says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. He obviously did not restore Israel or fulfill the messianic prophecies in his lifetime. And later, when he had risen from the dead, one of the first questions that the disciples asked Jesus was about this very thing. He told them that he didn't know himself when the time would be and that the plan was all his father's and not his own. Of course, Rome is still of the statue of Babylon and Caesar at that time in history was the king of Babylon. In Acts chapter 1 verse 6, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? God's own people, the children of Israel, did not recognize the first coming of Jesus and God's people crucified God in the flesh. Why do God's people today, in their blindness, believe that they will recognize his second coming whilst they are also in Babylon? Nothing changes, everything is cyclical. But don't forget it is all part of God's plan and is running to a fixed timescale. Traditions of the Elders To this day, the vast majority of Jewish people hold the Babylonian Talmud in higher esteem than the Torah, God's word. God told Israel to meet him in Jerusalem, in the temple, for that was where he would dwell. They were not allowed to meet wherever they chose. Deuteronomy 12, 13-14 says, Take heed that you don't offer your burnt offerings in every place you see, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of your tribes. There shall you offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. Changed name, changed character. Until Messiah comes, God's people are still in exile. The true remnant of Jewish people still believe this to be true, and are waiting for Israel to be restored by Messiah when he returns, and not by men before this event. The building of the synagogues, local places of worship, and the traditions of the elders that Jesus was so vehement against are all traceable back to Babylon. Months of the Jewish year were numbered in the Torah. They were called the first month or the tenth month, etc. But after the captivity of Babylon, Babylonian names were put to each of them and have remained to this day, any Jewish website will affirm. This was standard Babylonian practice to change the whole person and the culture. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar changed the names of Daniel and his three friends to Babylonian names, thus signifying a change of character. Daniel means God is my judge and was changed to Belshazzar, meaning Lord of the straightened treasure, an occult name if ever there was one. God also changed people's names as their characters were changed. Not forever. God prophesied that one day his people would be freed from Babylon. But until Babylon is destroyed, as Daniel prophesied, then God's people will always be in exile and will have to live as Daniel and his three friends did. When the kingdom is restored to Israel and the king returns, then we can feast and have rest. But until then, we must have tribulation. In Acts chapter 14, 22, it says, and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is not eternal life and neither is it Christendom or the present church. It is the millennial reign of Christ when the kingdom is restored to Israel. I believe that I will prove conclusively from scripture in a later volume of this study that this is without dispute, and that the church have claimed that Babylon is the kingdom of Christ, so purporting to be in the kingdom before the king returns. Parable of the vineyard. Jesus told a parable of a man who planted a vineyard and left it to a husband, to husbandmen to look after. 
His servants came to collect fruit from it and were beaten by the husbandmen and returned in shame. This happened many times and the outcome was always the same. In the end, the owner of the vineyard said, I will send my own beloved son, for they will respect him and give him the fruit of the vineyard. Most Bible expositors interpret this parable to signify that the owner of the vineyard is God and that his servants are his prophets and Jesus is the son. I also believe this to be the correct interpretation. Bring fruits worthy of repentance. The vineyard is a type of Israel throughout the Bible. The prophets were sent by God to tell his people that they were not bearing fruit and that they should repent and produce fruit. Fruit is a type of God's character, the fruit of the Spirit. And Galatians 5 is a good example. John chapter 15 is another passage that shows that fruit is the character of Christ that flows through the branches. We are the branches and so the fruit is evident in our lives when we manifest the character of Christ. The last prophet, John the Baptist, put this very clearly. Notice that he refers to Abraham as the root of their faith and not Moses. Luke chapter 3 verse 8 says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. It is the last part of the parable that I find very interesting and revealing. For it says that the servant said, this is the heir, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Jesus in this parable is without doubt the son referred to and his inheritance for going to the cross and obeying his father is to rule the kingdom of God on earth. King David in his Psalms writes, Psalm chapter 2, 7 to 9, The Lord said unto me, You are my son, this day have I begotten you. Ask of me and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Stealing the kingdom. The husbandmen, God's people, wanted the kingdom for themselves. And this is the whole issue we are faced with today. I will say much about this in a later volume, but we need to see the shadows and types that keep being fulfilled throughout history so that we are not deceived in this present age. We must not be deceived into building the wrong and counterfeit kingdom whilst claiming that it is the kingdom of God. In the next volume of this study, we shall see how all this is fulfilled as Jesus is born into the world. Another stage of the plan of God will be revealed. We must not forget that God's plan is for an eternal family. And now, almost 4,000 years after the first and physical Adam was created from the dust of the earth, a new and spiritual Adam was born into the world. God and his wife, Israel, would now have a beloved son.